Hi, welcome to Ritzak. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Join the Discord. Um, Zach, drop the sign in. <laughs> You're the one I looked at. <laughs> oh, Kenny's dropping it. Okay. Once it's once it's dropped by whoever eboard is in this room, that's not me. Uh, sign in. So you can get pizza. That's great. We love free pizza. Yippee. Check the calendar, super fun, cool events. All of our cool events are on there, all of our interest groups. Join it, link it to your Google Calendar, so then you can plan to come to our things. Ritzek mailing list, get the get the mail from Reina. Yeah. Ritzek feedback, we want to hear what your opinions are about the club. Yay, thanks Liz. I'm getting so much interaction from the audience today. <laughs> Education topic. If you have an education topic that you would like to present on or would like to learn more about um, that you think would be good for an hour presentation and some demos, submit it to this link here and it would be fun so we can have more interesting talks on our YouTube. Announcements. Yippee! A board positions have been filled. We have junior tech lead being Dan the Chance, web admin being Finn Capelli. I hope I pronounced your name, sorry. Social media head being Ariana Schwartz and junior ops lead being Ronan Gerber. Everybody give them a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! Congrats. Uh, Shmoo's a student in ShmooCon. Still happening. Uh, this is the link to the ShmooCon website. Uh, Shmoo's a student closes November 30th, and your letter of recommendation has to be submitted by that day. Um, so if you plan on doing this, please get it in soon. Um, okay, ops applications. We do not have, I love this pink, Ronan picked it. Um, we do not have a QR code yet. Uh, the ops lead and junior ops are creating the form. It should be released this weekend uh, for all ops signups. Um, if you don't know what ops is, um, ask Ronan and Scouts. Eboard will probably be able to answer, but if you have more questions about like what you do on ops in like terms of like being on ops, I would definitely ask the, the lead and the junior. Then we have WESIS announcements. WESIS has their own ops position. If you are non-male identifying, you can apply for that. Um, if you have any questions about any of these signups, uh, please feel free to ask WESIS eBoard. Uh, we are, WESIS is also opening a treasurer position, so you can apply as well for that, as long as you are non-male identifying. And then everybody who's a WESIS member is allowed to come to the potluck that we're hosting. Uh, there's information on the QR code and information in the WESIS Discord as well as we have a merch form. So if you want Wesis merch, fill out the merch form and you can get merch. Woo! Okay, next, Red Team has an announcement. Um, stand by as I read it. Red Team would like to thank all of the blue teamers that competed at IRSEC. Exclamation point. We had fun, comma, and we hope you did too. Exclamation point. <laughs> if you have a couple of minutes, comma, here is a form <laughs> for Red Team feedback colon. <laughs> uh, this is the form. It's a QR code. It's fun and fancy. Um, so yeah, fill that out if you competed this weekend. Um, next, because we do not stop moving along, uh, we have black team signups for ICS. When do they close, Zach? Two weeks. They close in two weeks. So if you want to be on black team for ICS, sign up. Um, are there any requirements? Cool, every team for the stream, every team will have at least one freshman on it. Um, so if you're a freshman, apply, because there's a good chance you'll, you'll get on black team, which is great. Yeah, they close in about two weeks. Uh, you know when they close, when one, it's announced in Discord, and two, it stops appearing during the weekly meeting. Bomb. Um, next, we have the Eaton CTF, yippee! Um, Eaton is an amazing sponsor of our club, and they're hosting a CTF that will have food um, on Wednesday. So you should come in, I believe it's six to 10. Uh, you guys should come in, make a team, have fun. Um, and there will be prizes as well. So speaking of sponsors, sponsors. More sponsors. More sponsors. Great. Uh, follow us on social media. Cool.
And without further ado, we have Ritzek Red Team by the amazing Red Team Chiefs, which are Kenny and Jason. <laughs> I just cracked open my uh, first monster of the day. We're, we're, we're sipping with Ultra Sunrise today. What's the what's the flavors in Ultra Sunrise? Can you like read them for this? Yeah, I will. I got you. Thank you. Um, the ingredients list. The ingredients. I'm not reading that. I'm reading the description. I'm get up. Get out. Go for it. Ultra Sunrise is dedicated to those who sacrifice sleep for passion, catching waves at dawn patrol, up on the bike, when the morning so dew gives the dirt more grip, or the first pass on that glassy lake kicking off an epic wake session. Ultra Sunrise will get you started, but it's great anytime this font's atrocious. Light, crisp, and refreshing with a flavor all its own. Pack with a full load of our monster energy blend to keep the fire burning all day. Yeah. Um, you're welcome. This one's not my favorite. Um, that's, that's real. We need a monster sponsorship. Yeah. yeah. Right, Thank you, Trace shoe. Tie your shoe. My shoe's untied. Jason's been dressing really nicely lately. Yeah. I really appreciate it. He's looking real dapper. As I've invested in the fall weather clothing. Thank you. Yeah. I went to H&M magazine. Really? <laughs> oh. I, I saw myself. I had a vision of me on the cover. Yeah. And then I bought those clothes to be on the cover. Yeah, yeah, no, I just been thrift. Yeah. yeah. Thrift they're they're going to call us, yeah. All right. <laughs> All We're going to get, get this cracking. H&M. Uh, shall we? Cheers, my friend. Uh, hello, my name is. Uh, oh wait, let's start over. This is the R I D Sack Red Team. We didn't change the font to match the rest of the fonts. Oops. It's okay. It don't matter. It, it don't matter. matter. We're gonna. Okay. Okay. The agenda. Yeah. Who am I? Who am he? As some would say. Types of offensive security. <laughs> Goals of Red Team. Red Team recruiting requirements. Triple R. How we Red Team. All right, let's and get it. Then not on the agenda, also red team resources, uh, red team requirements, and other things. Red team requirements is right there. Well, that's recruiting requirements. Oh. Yeah. All right. we didn't, we didn't have the agenda. It don't matter. Oh, I forgot about this. <laughs> One, once upon a time, there was, there was a story of two guys in the bathroom. Oh. <laughs> have you heard about red team? Alright, there are some chuckles. That was good. Alrighty. My name is Jason Howe. I'm in my fifth year at this marvelous institution. Um, I come from Boston. I don't really talk like I'm from Boston all that much. But that's where I'm from. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a red team. I've been here for many years now. Uh, I retired off black team. Uh, I, I do things. I fiddle. I tinker, as they say. That's a picture of me and Anthony. And this glorious person is Michael Vaughn. Sweet, sweet. For people man. who don't know who he is, he's actually making a guest appearance later, so stick around. You guys have seen this several times. I'm Kenny. I'm from the DMV. Um, fourth year C Psych major. I was doing computer engineering, but I got really tired and sad. Um, I do Wiggles and Red Team and Windows, Black, and Red Team. Um, I have plants and fish, and now I have a little cat named JPEG. Um, and yeah. What? <laughs> what do you say? Let's go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's go. All right. So, uh, offensive security <laughs> refers to the practice of actively attacking computer systems, networks, and applications to identify security vulnerabilities. It also means be the good bad guy to protect the good guys. So, here's some types of offensive security. Uh, there's red teaming, and in most cases, this is post exploitation, or it's like a longer engagement time span. Um, you have lots of you have lots of custom tooling. Generally, in our competitions, we're a bit louder. We want blue teamers to find some of the stuff that we can we deploy so that they can learn and understand what some attacks look like. Um, we collect passwords, we implement backdoors, and we have persistence on boxes. But professionally, if you're doing a red team. You know, like generally like longer engagements, it will be like three to six months. You'll try to emulate an, an advanced persistent threat um, that your client will be your target and be paying for you to come and do this stuff. You'll spend a lot of time doing OSINT, a lot of time fishing, trying to get the initial foothold. Then you'll be very slow, methodical. 
Um, oftentimes, you'll run scans that'll take like days to complete because you're trying not to like give away your location. Um, then like you'll do a lot of custom development if you can find some box that could be vulnerable. Um, with penetration testing, it's a different side of offensive security. These are like week long engagements. Uh, you're trying to gain initial access from public based infrastructure, from like the external side of the internet. Um, you'll do some OSINs to figure out like a username structure. You'll do password sprays. You'll use some professional tools like Nessus or other scanning tools just to assess vulnerabilities and then that they can go and patch. Um, if you're doing an internal pen test assessment, then you'll give an unprivileged account and try to see what, where you can go. Generally, very like Windows focused, you're trying to pivot through Active Directory and scrape privileges to get DA. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about red teaming in this presentation, but there should be a pen test presentation later. There's also the uh, vulnerability assessment and penetration testing interest group ran by Dan. Dan. Yeah, Dan so you here. Go, go talk to him of about not. pen testing. Um, also, we have vulnerability assessment, which generally refers to this, like compliance testing and regulations. So there's that side of authentic security as well. In summary, penetration testing, you're testing the system. and red teaming, you're testing the blue team. Um, and vulnerability assessment, you're testing compliance with the requirements. So you may be wondering, what are our goals? Uh, they consist of maintaining access and control, consistently and concisely performing service breaks. Concisely. Concisely. That's an adjective. I didn't put Actually, that there. That's, that's an adverb, I think. Implement cool slash novel persistent techniques. Persistence techniques. Oh my goodness, I can't speak English. And make cool stuff. I think that's really the most important. Thing from my personal opinion, um, you've kind of taken the stance of trying to push the people to make cool things and re-implement cool things they learn. Um, there's a photo of uh, me right there programming, actually. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Next okay. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I searched programming stock image. Yeah. He came I like the A on your forehead. Yeah, 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 my last name, Anderson. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Cool. So you, again, you may be asking yourself, what are some requirements for red team recruiting? Compliance, even. <laughs> Compl oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's talk about what's the difference between red team and red team recruiting. Uh, what are the difference between them? So uh, in, in red team, you know, we, we the operators. We go out to competitions, we deploy our malware, and we operate on these boxes. In red team recruiting, we're teaching you guys how to become operators. So you learn about persistence, you learn about red teaming on different systems. You start working out on your first tool, and then you eventually get to come and operate with us. So well, that's the difference. It's to make you less scared of us and open the door so red team is not as gatekeeping because that sucks when people suck. Real. Uh, quote, quote that. Quote me on that, yeah. yeah. Um, so continuing, you need to have the spirit of competition. Be nice, do good, not bad. Don't brick boxes instantly, right? Like I said, be fair to all blue teamers and then don't brick boxes. I just said that. Um, yeah. Um, compete in a minimum of two blue teaming competitions. Um, I've done my time blue teaming. Jason has done his time blue teaming. And I think that's a very important part of becoming a red teamer is that you are nice to the blue teamers because it sucks when you're getting dunked on. And being in that position yourself is very key to being in another position, i.e. red team. Yeah. Um, and another part is putting in effort for a red team. A lot of people like to come and like, yeah, 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 I'm red team, yeah, 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 and actually not do anything. They just want the title. Yeah. Um, certain like characters. Like certain, certain chase. Certain chase K-based individuals. Um, but yeah, no, seriously, I think it, it is a team effort, and it's important to show that you're a part of the team by both contributing to projects and helping others, i.e. giving back to newer students. Um, and then finally, you have to talk to us. Um, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, we just have a little conversation about uh, like what does it mean to be on a team to you? And that's not like a give your life to red team kind of thing. It's like, a, okay, what is your job competition? Like, how are you going to be a good red teamer? What kind of project are you working on? What kind of things can we do to help you out? Just a little, little touch base, make sure that like we're all moving in the right direction. You know, we like to establish effective communication. 
but we do. So uh, red team requirements. Um, yeah, it's good. Competition doesn't go away. Once you join red team, you still have to be a good adversary, like a good member of the team. And there's been times where people have joined red team and they've been goofballs during competitions and bad to ask them to leave because they didn't like uphold the spirit of the competition and kind of made it tough for a lot of people. Um, just and then being communicative, being present at engagements, um, asking for questions and asking for help, being willing to give help and help help the team. We have lots of cool projects, lots of like flashy things that people like to work on. We also need to cover like the basic requirements too, um, making sure that we like have something that's going to add users to box it and add something that's going to like check those users that are still there for the on competition. Like the boring stuff is also important, and so being able to Work on those and like not focus on just the flashy stuff is important for our team part of the team. And then I'm assisting with recruitment. We do a lot of meetings, talk about a lot of stuff. So we tap in our red team to come in and give guest presentations, talk about tools, talk about experiences and stuff like that. So that's the that's requirements for the red team. Jackie Stubbs. I want to tell a little little story now. So um. Because a lot of people sometimes they get worried about like the first red team tool, not knowing what, what it should be, how good it should be, how terrible it should be, whatnot. My first red team tool was called Alphabet Soup. And it was a little bash, like I think it was ten lines in bash. And it would count how many times they would enter the like the word clear into the terminal and like print out the clear comes out like four, five. If it got to like seven, it would change the keyboard layout to like some random thing. And then they had to figure out how to type like reset into the terminal and then they would get back to like a standard like layout and never got deployed never got used i don't think it even works but um that was my first writing tool very very crappy <laughs> um so this wasn't necessarily my first red team tool but it was the first one that i actually completed by myself um and um yeah i mean i can am i going to talk about the before i like in depth yeah. Okay, sure. For the context of that yeah, story. I'm start the timer on the Okay, story. yeah. I'm going to start leaking information. Um, yeah. So, pretty much, um, boom, 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 boom. I like to jump to the highest possible, or let's let not highest, but like the hardest, the most, most, complex. most complex project known to mankind reverse for a beginner. Reverse hijack. DLL. It was not a reverse Injection. hijack. Okay, anyway. So, it, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's. It's a Windows detour that that hides process names. Um, however, the the way that it works, it actually injects into the the application that actually call those functions. However, the problem was getting it actually successfully injected into all those processes. So I didn't write the Ansible for it. A certain character <laughs> on the screen named Enzo D wrote the Ansible for it, and he used AppCert in it to actually inject this into every single running process. The problem with this is when you inject into LSAS, it gets mad in blue screens. And then that's fine. I don't really care about blue screens. However, Mr. Basu cares about blue screens because when I blue screen 80 of his boxes, <laughs> he gets really mad at me. Um, so the tool worked, um, but I blue screened a lot of boxes in the process. Uh, the end. Chase K, would you like to come up and talk about your tool? What is this up here? You see that? What is that crossed out right there? It says sunshine. We had a sunshine for the stream. Little guest presenter right now. Yeah, so for, for my little red team tool last last semester in the spring, um, the Wookie you know, the one I used to get on red team, um, me and me and Jason were in the club room one night after red team recruiting, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I still have the piece of paper <laughs> with we sketched out the um, the C two framework of the bomb um, and how we would um, communicate using databases and have its uh, C2 um, capabilities through that. Um, I, I took it as an opportunity to learn a lot of um, Golang and SQL, which was actually really cool. So because now I, I use Go, Golang in my co-op, I use SQL for a variety of things. Um, a variety of things. A variety of things, like database, possibly in the future. Wow, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> it's almost like SQL is yeah. a database language. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who would so know? the bomb allegedly got deployed at UB in the spring allegedly, um, allegedly. with one alleged callback um, whether it actually worked or not it, it's lost in time in the sands of time um, right now it is right it's currently time, deprecated um, <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, for other uh, tools but thank you Chase yeah
Will and, there be a bomb V2? Yes, oh yes, God. yes, there will be. And we're we're telling you this just to, to let you know that your first tool does not have to be something glorious and crazy, and most of the time, or most likely, it will not work at all, um, or cause some kind of issue. But you know, we take L's in order to take dubs. Yeah, Joe. Joe's got some good stories. Joe and too. his memory leak. Come on, let's go. Come on. Story Next time. slide. Next slide. Oh, Come no, on. No, Next no, slide. Never mind. Never mind. Sorry. Moving on. Definition. This this one is definition. Silly. Never mind. Let me move on to define what definition is. Yeah, you got it. What is it? Oh no, this is this is crowd work. Oh, okay, moving on. Uh, so types of operators. This is so stupid. So hopefully <laughs> you guys, you so guys learned about this in like one forty. But uh, we figured since we're talking about offensive security, we're talking about the types of operators that we see. Um, so on like on the scale of like terrible op like terrible at operating to like the best at operating. The first one we have is uh, hackers. They're, um, they're like your generic bad guys, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they're like mid-tier operators. This is a Jason slide right here. <laughs> um, you know, you got your script kitties, which are like your worst operators out there. They're just using tools that everybody else has, has written. Um, they're not really like inventing new malware, you know? And then uh, you have your nation state actors, your state sponsored actors. They're, like, they're the people who get paid to be the bad guys. Um, and then you have like the RIT red team, we're like the best operators in the world. Um, and then, then like other categories of operators, you got the hacktivists, people who are like hacking for a cause, usually social or political. Um, you got your fishers and your scammers, people who kind of engage in trickery and tomfoolery for financial gain. Uh, and then you got your spear fishers, and then yeah, people can read. Cool. Moving on. So uh, malware definitions. So we have lots of different types. Of, of malware that we that you hear about. Uh, we don't use all the types of malware when we deploy things, because we don't really have a lot of needs for like viruses and worms and Trojan horses. Like These are things that you can use to propagate other systems and to get into a system, but we're all about post-exploitation yes. conflict, so we don't have a lot of need for that kind of stuff. Um, we generally deal with fruit kits and so we had a boot kit in development that didn't go anywhere. But um, yeah, it's like boot kits, boot kits. We have a lot of scripts. We have implants and agents. Everyone know what an implant is? Crowd work time? No? All right. So an implant is a piece of malware on a system that does not have like a callback to another server. It just exists there and it's listening. It can do something if you trigger it, but it's not actively speaking out to anything. It's not doing anything except for just waiting to be used. So an example of an implant is you have like a web shell on a box, like a, which would be just a web page that gives you the ability to run commands. Um, that is an implant because it's not like beaconing out to a central server. It's just waiting for you to go to that page and type in your command to run it. Um, agents are uh, also known as beacons, are like C2 agents. They are, they are pieces of malware that are on boxes that are calling out to a command control server, aka C2. And they're, they're actively sending network traffic, they're actively listening, actively calling back. So those, when we talk about implants, we're talking about something that's just there, we're talking about agents, it's something that's calling back. Um, rootkits are low level operating system stuffs. <laughs> that was this terrible. Moving on. Uh, scripts are just like bash, PowerShell, things that you can run once to change the configuration of a system. Yeah. Any questions? Great. I like this photo. The score check. To change, change, change the number. Number. Change the photo. Oh. That's supposed to be Mav's head. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, well. Um, so the difference between vulnerability, exploit, and a threat, right? So vulnerability is, is a weakness or flaw in a system design a code that may allow an attacker to leverage access to the system. So I would say think of a vulnerability as a very just bad lock. And the lock is very susceptible to you just shoving a screwdriver in that thing and turning it. The screwdriver would be the exploit, right? the actual implementation that you're using to take advantage of the vulnerability and the weak lock. Um, the threat would be the person 
who would be coming and doing these drive-by screwdriver attacks. Yeah. Where you shove the screwdriver in the weak lock and do a little yiggle and then it just opens. Yeah. Does that analogy make sense to everybody? This is like C-Sec 140. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Any questions about me and my screwdriver and me and yiggling locks? No? Okay, no, great. Is, great. Is you guys can... What? This is not C-Sec 140. They don't go over like... They don't really numbers? explain threats. Um, well, listen here. Okay. Listen here. I just explained real slick like. So now you know. Yeah. Now you know. Screwdrivers and me and locks. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you, Casey. Good. Good to Next know. slide. Next slide. So how do we red team? How to red team? Next slide, please now. <laughs> so we, <laughs> I love that image. I <laughs> take... Alright, so uh, depicted on the screen here, we have three words. Persistence, passwords, and backdoors. Um, if you've come to any amount of Red Team Recruiting, you know that these are the, this, is, this is the meat and the bones and the potatoes of uh, how we Red Team here. We need to have persistence on boxes, we need to collect passwords, and we need to have backdoors and support services. That's that's like the, the one of the most popular Red Team mantras out there. So, talking about persistence. We have a little saying, one is none and two is one. You always want to have persistence. Persistence is um, just ways to access a machine. So the more ways you have, the better off you are. In the example where Blue Teamer finds one of your mechanisms of persistence, if you only have one, they're going to find it, they'll take care of it, and then you don't have a way back into the system anymore. So if you have two, then you can use your other way to get back in and reestablish the first mechanism that you had. That way you have two again. So you can start off. Yeah, um, at least on the Windows side, we, we do deploy several like agents, and then we also have other implants on the box so that we can uh, regain access. Um, and on the right-hand side, <laughs> that picture is so silly. I'm sorry. That picture is very it's a, silly. It's a wallpaper of Michael Bond, and it's going to check your screen. <laughs> anyway, um, you may be asking, you may be asking, can you caption all of the pictures? I should caption all the <laughs> circle, whatever. Um, how do, how, at least on the Windows side, how do we achieve persistence? So the first method is just auto, uh, account creation. I love just going on boxes and creating unserious accounts and just adding them to all the groups. That's my favorite pastime, actually. You'll see the Kayla user. You'll see the, the Momo user. You'll see the Quan Quan user. These are all just, and Chase K only gets pulled out for ISTS. Um, <laughs> another method we use are bitch jobs. Um, forgot what bitch stands for, but it's like a uh, ground intelligence thank you service. Um, it, it's used for transferring files and delivering updates using like the the remnants of your like network bandwidth so that you can pull files without overloading your network. Um, it's pretty cool, pretty swag. You can kick them off and they're automatic and you just have it redeploy stuff. Um, you also have uh, win logon and auto run keys. Those are very nice. You just go in there, do a little bit of woo, -woo and then you have scheduled tasks. You have scheduled tasks that uh, kick off every time the system's rebooted. You have scheduled tasks that kick off every time someone logs on. You have it, uh, what is it, every time? Who's the other one? Yeah. Whatever. You get the point. Um, also, services. Um, it's very easy to kill an executable running uh, using Task Manager or whatever, but people don't really look at services because services run in the background normally. Um, that's the whole point of the service. Um, and yeah. Boot logon scripts. Yeah, boot logon scripts. So um, you in in FreeBSD, I have this sy system called RC. I don't know what it stands for, just RC. And you can configure scripts to run within like the RC daemon. And so every time the RC runs, which is all the time, it will pick up your scripts and run them for you. So if you want to have like a background service on FreeBSD, you just create an RC script, put it in a dark, put it in like a special directory, you're good to go. Um, yeah, we create or modify system services. So on Linux, this is like system D services. Um, on Windows, it's NSSM. It's like the NTLM something. What? NSSM is like simple uh, service manager. Yeah. Uh, the NSSM New store. service. Oh, uh, yeah. There it is. New manager. simple service manager. Yeah. And then uh, event triggered execution. So you can have things that happen when other things happen. So um, an example of this is bash profiles. There are configuration files on Linux that will get parsed and ran every single time a bash shell is created. 
And so this is very useful. You can just put um, like a beacon in there or you put like a create a new user, drop a firewall rule. You can do all this stuff every time a bash session is started, but every time a bash session is ended, like it's a, it's a good place to put things. Okay, 20 minutes. You have 20 minutes and you're oh boy. I'm gonna be over there for sure. All right, more persistence techniques. So we can hijack execution flows. That's um, yeah, another method of this is DLO hijacking, um, where you are able to replace a binary, or not binary, but like let's say a DLL, um, and a program will go to a specific path with a, looking for a DLL or a binary with a specific name, um, and we just change that. And then I name my DLL that name, and then we get rid of the old one, and we just have it kick off. Um, it's quite simple, really. Uh, in addition to this, I mean, path interception in, in function of Path interception for you, but yeah. function will be for me. Yeah, it's path interception on Linux. There's like 14 different places where you can place executables on Linux. There's user S bin, there's user bin, there's, there's bin, there's S bin, there's user local bin, user local S bin. Like you can read up on the documentation, understand how like what the parsing tree is for the executables, and then you can add your own version of that into a place where it will get parsed first. Then you can just add your function and call the original function. And then you've intercepted the path, and your code will executed, and then you'll have the actual functionality, and then you basically just added a backdoor ish something. You've added you added modifications. Yeah, and similarly, it's it's I mean function is kind of a generic term, but that's what it would be in Windows where we're doing something similar where we're actually hooking uh, functions that things would use. So your pro your program will go to call a function and I would be hooked into that function and then I would say ignore this string and then you, know, you return the output and it's like okay. Um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah we can do so, mod Pam. Yeah, you can about Pam. Yeah. All right. So mod modification of the authentication process. So Pam stands for pluggable authentication mod module. It's how you do authentic it's one of the methods you can do authentication on Linux. Uh, you use for a lot of things like SSH. It's used for login D. Um, if we we can modify that and just say like, oh, all users can log in without any passwords. If you don't change your pin config, you can change your password. We're just a login at any password because that's what pan says we can do. Um, well then we can also implement like password filters on the um, Windows. So I don't. It's been explained numerous times. I think it's called talks about it on it. But basically, yeah, you can just have. A, a function like a program that's listening and it's registered as a password filter and then when you change your password it gets sent the password filter and it gets sent back and then we just in our password filter we just ship out the creds and all that stuff but the the normal behavior for that is you can implement a program that will check for password complexity but we just use it to actual credentials mm -hmm. so how about scheduled tasks now on when uh, linux you got cron you got at what is a system command you have system timers um, on Windows, you have uh, scheduled tasks, auto run, run once. Yeah, auto run. The ones we three that we leverage the most are uh, auto run, is run once, and uh, win log one. Um, those tend just to work the best. And I think those are, the, from my knowledge, that's probably not true, but yeah, those are the three that normally used. Yep. Then we have a um, technique called traffic signaling. This is when you listen for a specific pattern in network traffic that's coming into the box. And if the pattern matches, you do something on that. So a, a simple thing like this is called a port knocker. You just you would have a, a binary listening for port, yeah. like a, a specific set of ports. Um, so if, say it's like 81, 82, 83. You'd have a client that sends a, like a, a TCP packet to 81, 82, 83 at like a specified interval, and then um, your cert, like your the victim box would be do something once it listens for those two packets and then you knock all those doors, quote unquote. And then generally, you did use this to get a shell. You can, just, you can like have this drop a firewall rule. There are like like normal uses for this too, but we use it And then uh, there's two techniques: server software components and client software binary modifications. Really, these are known as backdoors. You just change them to do something else. Put a backdoor in the system. Um, we do valid accounts, so you, you you can use a valid account to log into a system. We just collect passwords on this so that we can use like administrator, or we can use root to log in. And then account manipulation. Account manipulation. So 
adding all of the users to the administrators group, adding like SSH keys to all the user of Linux, um, elevating permissions in groups so that every single user is admin is another manipulation tactic. So any questions on persistent stuff? <coughs> all right, lots of our tools are in persistence. We're not in the game of like initial exploitation. We're not in the game of like exfil of information. So all, a lot of our tools come and they're based around these techniques. So everything that we mentioned here is something that we have a tool for. There's, I think, on the MITRE attack framework we'll talk about later, there's like 20 techniques inside of the business category. We have 17 of them covered in our tool. The other three are not really relevant to what we do because it's like office application modification. We don't have office applications, so it doesn't really matter. I think the other two were something else, but yeah. Tooling, if you need some ideas for tools, check out persistence on the MITRE attack framework. So talking about backdoors, <coughs> open backdoors in scored services. I don't think Zach is here. Zach is right there. Uh, <laughs> it is. So yeah, we put we put backdoors in scored services. Um, on web, we put web shells on boxes that are hosted web server. So if your scored service is like ISS or IIS, or if it's Tomcat or if it's Apache or Nginx, then we just put um, some sort of content on there. The server will host it, and then we can connect to your web server, go to that page, and have a web shell. Um, well, in MySQL, we have tools that will um, create special commands that we can use uh, for RCE. This works on all SQL databases, which is pretty cool. Um, FTP, there's some fun stuff you can do. But what we did for IRSEC was your traditional like FTP server was VS FTPD. We changed it to Pro FTP, which had a back. We put a vulnerable version of it in, and we could use it to get shells. That was talked about in the DB. Um, what you got for Windows? Yeah, DNS. I have nothing to talk about for DNS. I know a lot of yeah. our tools leverage DNS. However, I've not personally done anything with DNS. For L80 and LDAP outside of creating malicious users, we've been doing some fun things uh, like standing up our own uh, domain controller and joining your uh, uh, boxes because AD is very scary. And when you start getting into the weeds of, of that forest, Stuff that's not scary, man. Um, but it works for us. Um, for us and B, it's quite simple, really. We just modify the permissions so that anybody can read and write to the share. Um, because normally there's an administrator and everyone, and then there's also a guest thing. Um, but we just play around with permissions there. Um, plus leveraging the fact that we have agents with all boxes um, to do yeah. this. Um, backdoors and critical services. I mean, we could talk about this. Um, you probably should look up at SSH. I don't really do anything with SSH. Yeah. So um, SSH, so I guess the difference between score services and critical services. Score services are the ones that like you're needing to do so you can get points on the scoreboard. But critical services are generally connection-based protocols that you need to access your cloud boxes. So like SSH, you use it to access your cloud boxes. Um, WinRM is for Windows, Windows Remote Management. Um, we put backdoors on those because you need to use them so you can keep them like working which is good for us. So SSH, some, some easy things to do with there is you can drop SSH keys. So every user has an, like an authorized keys file. And you just put your key in there, and then you just log in using your private key, and it works. Um, we also changed the config so that it says that root can always log in, which is not good for root damage. It's good for us. Yeah. Yeah, we do modify the uh, WinRM config um, to allow us to better access it. Um, on top of that, we do leverage the, the quote unquote LOL, I can't speak English, LOL bins um, and, and protocols or LOL libs. What does that um, stand for? Living off the land. So we like leverage PS exact, we leverage WMI, um, which are all like native administrative things used in the Windows ecosystem, but they work for us because we want to administer your boxes too. Um, on top of the fact that you're using them normally to administer your boxes. Um, so if, if and when we have malicious users at our permission, we just administer your boxes. 
Um, it exacts nice web GUI shell things. Yeah. On PFS. On PFS specifically, because that's his domain. Mm-hmm. Right, Zach? Unfortunately, the PFS guy here. Yeah. All right, moving on. Password collection. So um, I'm going to here. We can use binary shims to modify the execution flow. And in that process, we can just get the plain text input and ship it out to our logging server. Um, that's how we do some password collection on Linux. Then I'll talk about password filters. So this is on Windows. Basically, you like say, I want to hit my password. It goes to the, I'll say since for the local service account, something. Nope, not anyways. Uh, and then it goes to Sam, and then there's a password filter, and then it just gets exported, and it's beautiful. Any questions? Great. Cool. Um, we also do a little bit of a NTLM hash cracking um, because it's very easy to crack NTLM like V1 hashes. Like you can, if you get an NTLM like one hash, and you can like use your own computer to do it in like 10 seconds. It's that easy. So when we deploy our like 128 gig box on the stack, <laughs> just roast all of the accounts. And a little technique called uh, ASREP roasting. Look into that. It's very fun. Um, we just get the, the hashes and we crack them that way. Very, very easy. Um, then, yeah, we can also just capture plain text in the key loggers and uh, there's other things like that. Yeah. There's a little diagram up there for interrupt based key logging because uh, there have been people learning in the past that have done that bowling key logger crap and then it jacks up CPU usage and it's very ugly. Um, so we do get our based for that. Yeah. All right, moving on to uh, how we maintain remote access, um, which is also known as like C2s and having shells. So we have we have three kinds of things we're going to talk about here. we got bind shell, reverse shells, and covert beacons. I don't know what this diagram is here. It was, very it was I, 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 let me see. It's like, I, I, I wanted to fill the space with a picture, but what do you, what do you search? I, I wanted a C2 to be up there. So I Googled C2 diagram, and that was like the first P and D that came up, and I thought it would look good, but this it doesn't. Like, it just needs to be bigger. Yeah. Like, I'm lying. Yeah. Right well, we can just explain it. Um, what is a bind show, Jason? Uh, moving on to a uh, okay. bind show yeah. slide. Maybe we'll come back to that again. Who knows? So uh, bind shells are shells that listen on a port. Um, it's like SSH or like Telnet or it's anything without a password because you're just listening for a connection, you're piping that connection into bin bash, and then you just have, when you connect to that port from a remote host, you just have a shell, you have bin bash on the host, which is wonderful. Um, so a little diagram here. The attacker machine connects binds to the victim, which is really cool. So we have the opposite of this, we have reverse shells, where the victim calls out to the attacker. So you, it's, it's the same concept here as bind shells, but it's in reverse. Then we know why reverse shells are better than bind shells. Yes. Um, because you don't get around the firewall, because you can be stuck in a network that calls it directly. Yes, the answer there is they can get around the firewall. That is exactly right. Most times, if you call it configuration for firewalls, is drop incoming traffic in, but let everything coming out, out. So if I try to call back to like a random port as like ephemeral, then the, the firewall will be like... Ephemeral? <laughs> yeah, that's a word. It means like all the all the ports after like, what, I think it's like 1,048 are ephemeral ports. Um, ephemeral. That's, ephemeral. Yeah, that's what I was laughing at you. Uh, okay. Whatever. Thank you, sir. I, I can finish. Good. Um, yeah, they get our firewalls, which is good for us. Moving on to covert beacons. So, um, generally, simple beacons work just by creating socket connections. You can also hide your beacon inside of normal traffic, like DNS, HTTPS, HTTP, um, ICMP, and then you can, you can encrypt your content, and then you have a C2. So here we have a picture of Enzo. But you didn't know that because he had the skies on. That's the same way that our beacons work. And then you can also do C2s over interesting channels like TLS, or you do it with a Discord. And the whole idea behind this is utilizing something that's always going to be up. Um, 
in almost all cases, ICMP will be utilized by a device. Um, HTTP and HTTPS will be utilized by a device, and DNS is, is a given because you won't be able to resolve names without it. Um, so that's what we do mm -hmm. because you're not going to deny DNS traffic and you're not going to deny ICMP traffic. So mm -hmm. this course a little bit different. Yeah. So talking about infrastructure here, we're talking about C2s. Um, so if C2s control agents on victims, we have team servers that control C2s. So you can say we have like a Windows C2, we have a Linux C2, we want to do a break across everything. We can talk to our team server, it'll send the commands to the appropriate C2s, and then all the operating needs to do is talk to the team server. It makes everything streamlined, and it, it kind of centralizes all of our communication, and it's, it's good for the teamwork. That's why it's called a team server. Then we have CDNs, which stands for Content Delivery Networks. This is used for hosting files, hosting implants, hosting malware. So if we have a team that's caught one of our agents, mm -hmm. we can use one of our other persistent mechanisms to go get the file again and just put it, clone it, like pull it down, reestablish it on the box, and add, have the agents back up, which is very powerful for us. And we have logging servers um, just to collect information about our C2 operations. We try to log our commands for different purposes. And then we also like log blue team passwords in a central location so we can use them. It's all, it's all good infrastructure stuff. Um, some other infrastructure stuff you'll see out there, something called redirectors. So you can use this to kind of obfuscate your traffic. You can say you have like a web C2. Oh, it's on the diagram right here. So like your victim would call out to this guy, but if like you have a blue team operator that's looking at like this IP address and like, oh, what's going on over here? Then they can go and look at it, but since it's just a redirector, it's gonna look, it's gonna listen for like a special endpoint, and if the endpoint is hit, then it'll send the traffic back to the to the C2. Otherwise, it'll just direct it to some random thing. So this is good for hiding our actual C2. You can burn a redirector very easily, but very easy to set up. Um, but if you burn your C2, that's a lot harder to, to move and to fix and to replace. So redirector is pretty cool. <coughs> Anyways, talking about deployment practices. Uh, I have to call. Yeah, this is a lot of text. I'm going to try to summarize this real slick. Like, we got five minutes. So we got to go. Okay, so deployment practice. The prep that goes into the pre deployment. So, the first and most important objective that's a bullpen, should it be, um, is to one, understand the layout, understand the landscape, understand the amount of boxes on the, the topo, understand what services are running on the boxes, understand how you're going to actually access these. Um, have a plan of the tools that you're actually going to be deploying. Um, it would be good to have a general idea of what actually works and has been tested. Um, and talk to the gray slash white team, ask questions. Uh, we can also talk to black teams that have deployed it um, because it's good to understand what will break things. Um, and organize your team effectively. So the general idea that we have is to appoint a leader for a specific task. Um, whether it's Windows, Linux, um, networking, uh, like actually doing the breaks on those and then regaining access to those boxes. It's kind of a concept we're trying to do more because it works when we do it. Um, and it, it communicate with each other, right? Um, that's kind of the thing that's been lacking in the past and that actually is what helps a team work effectively is talking to one another. Um, there's been many instances where people have had access to boxes but no one knew because they did not communicate with each other. Um, yeah, so on the right side, I already know that PHP. Okay, yeah, I have talked talk about that. I already know the default credentials. Yeah, I have to talk about that. Um, yeah, yeah, speed. Eh, speed. Sometimes. Sometimes, Once, like, yeah. minute zero and something breaks, you got to go in and fix it real quick. Yeah. Real, real slick like. Real slick like. Right. Um, that's the synopsis of that. So, yeah, if you, if you do all of this, all you need to do is have your master boy scripts ready to go, which we do with Ansible. So, Ansible is a wonderful tool. Um, it allows you to, to do everything on, on a system that you can do from the command line. You can do it in Ansible. It is very stable. It's well documented. Docs for Ansible are great. I use them all the time. I'll be when I'm writing new capabilities for Red Team. I have the Ansible docs up over here. I'll be writing over here. I'll just look look up what I need. Make sure that all the arguments are right. Make sure everything's going to work. Um, I've given numerous talks about this. I don't want to go too deep, but basically, you just make an inventory file. 
that this is what your hosts are, this is where the teams are, these are your groups. Then you write your, your variables for the groups. You say like this is the password, this is the username, um, this is how I want to connect the box. Then you create like your, your list of things to do with the box. Mm -hmm. Then you put it all together in what we call a play. And then you run the play and it works and everything's great. Um, there's a talk right there, you can go look at it. There's also good talks and good docs out there. So um, knowing Ansible is a requirement for Red Team, like kind of sort of unofficially, because if you want to deploy your malware, you need to be able to like deploy it somehow effectively, use Ansible for it. So understanding how to use Ansible and how to run it and how to write it makes you a very valuable member of the team. So improving our development practices. Yeah, I got on them earlier this year about this stuff in the past. We kind of just like made crap and threw it and it just did not work. And I think one of the biggest things we're working on now is actually testing our stuff. There was this, uh, I don't know if it's an analogy, but this thing called uh, 007 development um, where it's like, what is it? Zero, zero, <laughs> zero test, zero testing, seven broken boxes, something like that, or seven yeah. memory leaks, something like that. It's just yeah. not good practice. I also um, really excited <coughs> that presentation one time. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun time. But yeah, um, working on <coughs> when when you're doing your testing, make sure that like your box that you're testing on can run 24 hours successfully without having anything crazy happen. So like, if your box if your box doesn't work, it's bad. But if it works for like three hours and then it boot loops, that's also bad. Yeah. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, that was something that we started running to in the past where stuff would be existing one boxes for a little bit. And like, oh, yeah, the board's still green. And come around comp time in like two days, stuff starts breaking and boot loop the boxes. Tell me how I know. Mm -hmm. um, memory, memory leaks. Um, but yeah, um, the next thing would be like a functioning callback and we're testing the corresponding server. A lot of people would just drop their agents on the box and like, oh, yeah, the answer was green and deployed. Um, and not extract the callbacks is very important because, like, for example, me, I went to go deploy tooling that has worked historically and, you know, without any, any qualms. However, I was getting callbacks and then I was not getting the correct output. So, you know, that's important. Um, something that we're working on as a collective is actually documenting our stuff. It's very easy to make something and have it work and then, like, yep, it worked. And then, yeah, it's a tool. Um, but not actually documenting it so other people can use it, like I was saying before, where you have all these tools, all these great ideas, and all these programs. But there's no documentation and no one knows how anything works and only you know and then you leave and you graduate and then it's just dead because you're not here. Um, boom, 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 boom. So offsite concerns. Um, yeah, encrypted slash offsite uh, communications. You know, you know, you have these agents on the box that are communicating over various protocols that are very visible in a uh, packet tracer. Uh, Wireshark, you're sending data and commands and creds in plain text. So if you just open up Wireshark and just sees, oh yeah, execute this command from this IP, boom, you're dead, right? Yeah. Um, so we need to do some kind of uh, encryption mechanism. What was Anthony's uh, XOR with, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it was something silly. Yeah. Um, but no crazy callbacks. We don't need your agents calling back every one minute. Mm. That's loud and atrocious and nasty. XOR, XOR yeah, something silly. Um, yeah, it, it just doesn't need to be. So TTL implants, um, type to live, so they kill themselves after comp's over, so then you don't have implants on boxes calling back forever, because that's nasty. Um, and Ansible to tear down and clean up, so t uh, not time stamping, uh, time stomping your binary so that they're not, you know, time stamp, and it's like, yeah, easy tell to sign your own box. Um, what else? Cleaning up other various indicators, clearing the log, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to pop on the crazy callbacks thing. Um, there was a C2 that we used for IRSEC, and I we developed a program that would call back the C2 like once, and let's get a command and run it, and that would be it. And I put a call to that binary everywhere on those boxes. It was in all the batch profiles, it was in all the cron drops. That, that thing was getting run like 20 times a minute, and that crashed the C2 server. So when you're testing your malware, make sure that like your server can handle the traffic that you're gonna generate, and your client is not going to crash the box. So both sides of the equation that one. And um, yeah, a little blue team tip. There's a command on, on systems called find. And then there's arguments you can pass into that find command for time. So modified mod, uh, modification time in the last 24 hours, last week. If you use this, you can find files that have been modified in the last week. If I can doesn't time stop, the mod their file we modified within the last week, it's very easy way to find that way. So that's why the time's not. So that we, we don't get burned when people are on the find command. Uh, tool dev tips. So 
if you want to start writing your first protein tool, first thing you got to learn is like, what is normal on the box? How does the OS work? What is the services look like? What do things, what is like, what's normal for this box? And once you know that, you can start understanding how you can make your tool look normal so it doesn't get burned. Um, knowing how things are supposed to work is the basis of knowing how to break them. So uh, looking at known techniques, other attack frameworks we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, very good. Looking at tools, reading docs, just be curious. Man pages are great. I use them all the time. Um, there's a talk out there by Enzo about MSDN, how to understand that. So lots of lots of things that help you learn. But you just gotta be curious. Gotta get that out there. Gotta go understand and read and practice. Just write something, test it on a VM, if it breaks, it breaks, it's been on a VM. Figure out what broke, fix it, go from there, just iterate over the process, and get there. Um, things to avoid when trying to make the first fetching tool, don't worry about it, don't worry if it already exists. If you have an idea, go for it. We're not looking for you guys to write the most craziest novel, bootkit, and C2 at the same time piece of malware. Just write something that you're excited about, and then go from there. Like, we had a scratch C2 at IRSA. Now, that was pretty funny, pretty goofy. I don't know how well it worked, but it, just, it worked, which is pretty pretty fun and goofy. Um, and yeah, we, we told the story about like our first writing tools. That like, mine was not amazing at all. Never got to put, but it was a start. And that kind of inspired me to go some, like look at some different things, and that kind of just got me involved in what the next developed. So just get started, put some code, on the on the screen, make it run, see what happens. Um, yeah, don't be discouraged. We have lots of we have lots of stories about red team failures that we can share with you guys river down because they're quite entertaining. Some resources. So this is the Miter Attack Framework. You can go to attack.miter.com, something like that, and look at this. And there's like very interactive, really good to instruction about how all these things work. This is we focus on execution, persistence. <laughs> For uh, for that some ish and some defensive agent and special access. We don't do initial access. We don't do discovery, movement. We some do some collection. We yeah. don't really do any expo. And I mean we have C2 as well. But that's kind of where we're to focus. Lots lots of cool things in here. As I said, we've lateral done, movement, yeah, a bit. We've got like twenty like we've got seventeen of like twenty things covered under Fearless, which is very, very sorry. Under which is very, very cool. Persisting in lateral movement, generally, or in credential access, or normally. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, attack lifecycle. So, what we do, this is like an attack lifecycle for all situations you would do, like your initial reconnaissance, you figure out what's there, how it has a vulnerable, how you exploit it, then you get your foothold, sorry, you get your, like, your compromise, you get your first shell, you have the foothold, that's the computer, you're just doing more. Um, you're trying to execute the ability to get to your target. So you just go around in a circle, you do reconnaissance, you move it, you pivot, you establish more persistence, and you keep yeah. going, and you keep going, and you keep going until you get to your target, and then you're done. Yeah. The only reason I uh, X those out is because Ansible kind of just takes that out of the entire equation for us um, because it does it for us. We have an inventory file mm -hmm. for doing the initial recon. Our initial recon is the inventory file, and then initial compromise is us. Yeah, deploying. It's it's that simple. Like it's it's yeah. So yeah, this is what my like post exploitation like competitions. If it was a pre exploitation competition, that'd be CPTC. Um, that'd be pen testing fully and one hundred percent. So, but yeah, this is like for real world red teaming and penetration testing stuff. Cool. Uh, some links, just some stuff. So we have our wiki. There's some good like compilation of notes out there. Um, and just man pages, blog posts, reading up on stuff. Yeah. So uh, that's all we got time for. So uh, thanks for coming.